Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Matthias Endler. Matthias is a coder who likes to work in Rust and Go. Uh, he works for Trivago in Dusseldorf, Germany. As well as coding, he enjoys organizing meetups, speaking at conferences, and writing. When asked to describe himself in five words, he went with curious, driven, humble, brilliant, and funny. <laughs> He's very optimistic about the future of technology and believes we are very fortunate to be here to witness such an exciting time. Uh, He's spoken at many tech conferences in the past, but this is his first time here at BrizTech. His talk today is titled, Wonderful WebAssembly and the Future of Computing. Please join me in welcoming Matthias. Surprisingly many people coming in still. That's astonishing. You can always find a place uh, also at the front. There's some more spare seats here. Uh, the, as a hint, it might even pay off to sit in front. But who knows? We will find out. <laughs> There's a slight uh, echo here. I don't know if I'm too close to the mic or so. Just, I don't know if this is off. I guess it's off. Yeah. So uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to my talk, uh, the wonderful WebAssembly and the future of computing, which is definitely not clickbait at all. <laughs> um, but now that I got your attention, I wanted to raise your awareness for this new technology. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of you uh, today and also yesterday, and I was surprised that a lot of people didn't even know about WebAssembly and what it is and what it's about. And it was really surprising to me because to me, this is literally the future of where computing is going. But maybe to kick it off, uh, I wanted to introduce myself real quick. So, as Rich already mentioned, I'm Matthias, and uh, I work at Trivago, which is a hotel search company located in Düsseldorf and in Amsterdam, and I mostly do backend. So, I'm comfortable with everything that runs on a server or everything that runs on a cloud instance, but somewhere in the background, maybe the closest that I get to the front end is usually an API. And I haven't used front-end technologies in a long time. I just recently started using Svelte again, and I like it. But the main point is I'm kind of afraid of front-end. It's not something that I'm comfortable with, uh, something that I deal with on a daily basis. Usually, I work with Python, Go, and Rust. Um, I am part of the Rust community, and that's also how I got interested in WebAssembly. And as part of the community work, I also uh, have a YouTube channel called Hello Rust, which is a channel about intermediate Rust concepts that will help you get started with the language, uh, get to know the features, the functionalities, how you can use it, and so on. And I also blog from time to time uh, at endler.dev. You might want to check it out. And you also definitely have to subscribe. Actually, every YouTuber has to say that at every uh, given occasion, so please subscribe to my YouTube channel. But uh, coming back to the talk, it's about WebAssembly. I want you to think about your first computer. And, well, maybe it was an Amiga. Or maybe it even was a Commodore. And maybe for the really old rookies, it might have been an Altair. <laughs> but obviously, a lot of people uh, have started with uh, what is the most uh, well-known computer, a PDP-11. Obviously, that's probably what you started with. Uh, that thing weighs one ton, has one megahertz, and 4K of RAM. And uh, it's not the entire thing. A lot of people think that this is the machine. No, the machine is at the bottom where the PDP-11 logo is. The top stuff, that's just tape drives and all that stuff. So um, Nick is one of the organizers here. And he said, OK, um, can we spice it up a little bit? Can we spice up the talk a little bit? So I'm known for maybe also uh, doing that from time to time. So what I will do today is I will have three questions for you. And whoever can answer them, like the quickest, will get a little reward. Um, so we will start, whenever I 
I, I asked you, like, the next slide will be important, so this slide will be important. So if you know any of those three people, any, then you can scream out the name. Ken Thompson is correct. Thank, yeah, well, that's all right, Julie. So, but uh, uh, I only got uh, three, so it's, it's fine. Uh, but only the first one will get a reward. So the reward is a double decker from Cadbury, which is supposedly a brand around here. So uh, <laughs> who, who, you, can you, can you catch? Because I can throw, so. Actually, that was quite nice. It was quite nice. But you got, you got two more chances, okay? Uh, so, so yeah, uh, as he said, this is uh, more or less the elite league of Unix hackers. Dennis Ritchie on the left side, Ken Thompson, and uh, Brian Cunningham. And those three, if you look at them in this context, it looks very academic. But if you, if you saw them on the street, they probably would walk around like that. And that could literally be your uh, Bristol street artist next door. They, that's how they look like. Uh, or actually some, some coffee shop owner, hippie kind of guy. Anyway, th those people, they were, they were smart and they were energetic and they had, they had this inspiration. They built this thing called Unix. And Unix uh, was coming out of frustration from Maltics. Because Maltics was this huge thing that they built at Bell Labs with another corporation. And, and it was big, a uh, big project. And uh, that was problematic because no one understood it. And it was very, very complex. So in, in the vein of versus better, what they did was they built this little tiny thing to play computer games with. Uh, and that's what they did. So they built this kind of uh, Unix operating system run on a PDP-11. And one game of their Asteroids clone cost $50. And I guess Dennis Ritchie called it funny money, because uh, in reality, yeah, uh, the computer was there anyway. So the Unix was a really cool little system. Actually, by looking at this thing, I, I uh, Googled for the logo. And this was one art that I created. I even had hoodies once. I never sold a hoodie. Unfortunately, but uh, maybe maybe I will I will bring that shop back up. Anyone would buy that hoodie, by the way? Do we have a market for that? No one would buy the hoodie for the record, so maybe not a good idea. Uh, Unix is very simple. It just takes a genius to understand its simplicity, and this is going to be important. Uh, this is a quote by Dennis Ritchie, from one of the creators, and uh, th this is going to be very important for the rest of the talk. Simplicity is what made Unix popular. It was not only sim simple to use, it was also more simple to develop. Because early on, they found that one of the big problems was that every machine had different hardware and different ways to program it. So what they did was they took this language called B that uh, Koenig and, and Richard wrote, and they made a version called C, which is just a slightly better version and it's also a very, very simple abstraction on top of assembly. And the, the main point is you have to write the standard library once, but then all your code runs on the next machine. So it's, it's very flexible. And uh, again, Dennis Ritchie said, C is what made Unix uh, portable, maybe even possible. Um, it ran on more than one platform. So simplicity, portability. You might be asking, why does that have anything to do with WebAssembly? Well, fast forward a couple of years, uh, we got another guy who was important for the way we think about computing. And the guy will be on his next slide. Hint, this is going to be your next opportunity right there. So it's going to be a little tougher. Uh, but if you know the guy, then uh, please scream out the name. <laughs> Close. <laughs> you get another chance. You get another chance. Who, sa Who said it first? <laughs> OK, uh, that's uh, kind of unfortunate because we have two very renowned people here. So uh, one only gets the treat. I'm sorry, but uh, 
probably you should get more than half of it, but uh, it doesn't really matter. You should share. Um, anyway, uh, okay, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, exactly. And um, what does he have to do with WebAssembly? Well, he created this thing called the World Wide Web. And the cool thing about it is it's kind of simple. You look at the syntax, you can understand it, you can write it with a simple text editor. You don't have to be a computer scientist. Uh, you don't have to have special tooling. It runs on every device. If a tag gets deprecated, your website won't break, the functionality won't work, but the code will still execute and you will see text. So for example, the blink text, blink tag, it's, it's not supported anymore, but the text would still be there on the website. And if my browser doesn't have a no new functionality, well, in the worst case, all the rest would work, well, just this slight li uh, little bit wouldn't work. So again, a very, very simple and extensible uh, syntax and format. Um, actually, the World Wide Web is more than just HTML, of course, but it's an example for robustness because of simplicity. Here's the first machine that he used to come up with the draft for the World Wide Web. Uh, on the bottom left, it says information management, a proposal. But I, what I find more interesting is the label on the right side, which says, this machine is a server. Do not power down. Like imagine uh, the cleaning personnel reading this and like, what is a server? <laughs> OK, this is literally the first server. Right? Like, how, how can you expect people to know that? But um, that's the next cube, uh, so a really, really power machi uh, powerful machine. And that was built at CERN. So again, uh, 25 years later, they came up with this idea after Unix, and uh, it kind of revolutionized the way we think about development again. But the web is more than just uh, websites. You can see the number of websites growing, obviously, and also exponentially. But it's more than that. It's a it's a delivery platform. It's a distribution network. Uh, what you can do is write applications with it. And you can, you can ship code to your clients without having them to install any software or know, I don't know, how to, how to use a setup installer. It just works. And you can link to stuff. You can collect stuff. And people noticed that. And uh, there were a lot of smart people, of course, so they started using the web for dynamic content. Uh, first with JavaScript um, and in a very simple way. But it was interactive. It worked and it provided some value. But it, the, here's the problem. JavaScript was never designed for those big applications that we write today. Uh, it was written in 10 days, but we still use it 25 years later. And that's kind of a problem. Even though the execution model is brilliant, it's simple, and it's also safe. So it's in your browser. You don't, you're not exposed to viruses, maybe with cross-site scripting, but then you're screwed anyway. Uh, people started noticing the flaws of JavaScript real quick, though. So they noticed that maybe the syntax was not very expressive, and they wanted some, some better way to, to write code, some maybe class-based way or uh, better functional way. Uh, so on the left side, you have CoffeeScript, which is a dialect of JavaScript that transpiles to JavaScript. On the right side, you have the vanilla JavaScript. You don't want to write the thing on the right side, but you don't have to, because what you write is on the left side. And this is much easier to understand. So this was one of the first steps uh, where people noticed that the, the web as a platform could evolve, and you could add new functionality without compromising what you already have. And then people notice that, well, we have all of the software in the back end, and we cannot ship it to our clients anymore because they only use browsers. And we don't want to rewrite it, well, because it's, it's a lot of effort. And the software is not written in JavaScript. It's maybe written in C++ or C or any other language. And then people, smart people, figure out a way to take this code and run it in your browser and pretend as if it was JavaScript. So in 2012, 
Emscript came around. And the goal was to have a compile target uh, that is JavaScript. So you have C or C++ code, and you run it through LLVM, which is uh, the low-level virtual machine, and it creates some kind of JavaScript output, some, some uh, JavaScript token from your LLVM bytecode. And this is what you run in your browser then. And if you look at it, it's madness. It's sheer madness. You don't want to write this ever. Uh, if, you, if you see someone writing this code, then probably you don't want to be in their team. <laughs> um, but the, it has a few advantages because it's safe and predictable. So for example, if you look at D equals D or zero, well, you know JavaScript does not really have an integer type. It has a number type, but not an integer type. This way, you can tell the compiler, look, I got this. You can optimize this code path now because this will always be an integer. There will be no typecasting whatsoever. Uh, and this will make your code very fast because it's very predictable for your runtime, like V8. And this way, you have a lot of tricks like that. For example, a bit shifting here, you see, uh, computers are really good at bit shifting because this is what we do, uh, moving from one register to another. Uh, or, yeah, declarations at the top and so on. It, it's all built for executing, not for understanding. Not for the human, but for the computer. But once you combine this power with your browser, you can do magical things. Like this is a demo from 2013. And I wish you could hear the sound. Huh? Ah, actually you can. So this is running in your browser uh, in Firefox Nightly back in the day. That was, I guess, Firefox 22 or something? Like, imagine the possibilities that suddenly you can ship a whole AAA game to every user instantly without having to sell any DVDs. If people still had DVD drives at the time. Um, and it works flawlessly. But there were some disadvantages. Uh, first off, there were performance differences between the different browsers. Every browser had their own set of advantages and disadvantages, and some parts were optimized for Firefox, some parts were optimized in Chrome, and then, yeah, that was sad. Uh, and it still requires parsing, compiling, and optimizing your JavaScript. It builds an AST uh, from your code, and yeah, that takes time. But most importantly, there was no specification. That meant that any proprietary provider could go and build their own version of ASMJS because there were no standards, um, and then it would be incompatible again. And those problems were severe, and that's why I guess ASMJS never really took off. But fortunately, those ideas were integrated into another project, which is WASM, or actually WebAssembly. So it might come as a shock to you, but you can use it today in more or less every browser. And it works on 85.8% of all browsers today. Uh, and it also works outside of the web. So you could go and build any type of application. Uh, this dog built a video editor for me just for this demo. It's like, I highly appreciate it. But there's no download, no installation. You can uh, write games, uh, real-time music without latencies. And maybe, maybe someday, someone might even write a better Slack client with it. <laughs> but can't you do all of this just with Java? We had Java applets for decades. Like, what's the point? Well. This is the point. Uh, do you want to run this application? This is really scary, and it has unrestricted access to your machine and uh, to your data, and you have, pro oh my god. Uh, I click that button with fear every time. I'm like, nah, maybe not. So it's not safe. And it's also proprietary. There's a company behind that with their own interests. And there's no specification. It's also not the fastest because it's not streamable. You have to download the app, applet first, and install it into your browser. And every developer and every user has to do that. And that it takes a lot of time. So that's why WASM came along. And it changed a few things. For example, it's fast. 
That means it's, it's almost native speed. It's a, a binary format, so you can save yourself the time for parsing. You can start right with the execution. And it also has a type system, so it is statically typed. That means the, your compiler can optimize a lot of things for you. And it's a very, very simple state machine. I will get to that in a second. Uh, second, it's safe. So it's a sandbox that runs inside of a web, WASM embedder, as they say, and uh, nothing gets out of it. Memory is isolated. So if you want to pass something into WebAssembly, you can do so, but you have to explicitly do that and allocate memory for this machine. And also, it's well-defined, so there's a standard behind that. And it's language independent, that means every language can be compiled into WebAssembly, whether it's Go or Rust or LOL code, all the popular languages. Uh, it's also streamable, that means you can execute while you still read things uh, from the network. And it's parallelizable. Um, the, the parsing and the execution happens in parallel for, for all the functions that you define. But what a lot of people don't get is WebAssembly is neither web nor is it assembly. It's kind of the worst misnomer you can have, but yeah, uh, that's, that's what it is. It was built for the web. It's not meant for the web. It's meant for an execution engine in general. Uh, so it can run out of, outside of the browser. And also, it's not assembly, it's bytecode. Um, and it's WASM bytecode. It's a special f form of uh, bytecode. The way this works is uh, in three steps. You have decoding, you have a validation and you have execution. Decoding means you get a stream of data, WASM's code uh, from the network, and you just read it. Validation means you check the types so that you're sure that it's also safe, and uh, you execute it, obviously. Um, so if you compare that with JavaScript, the, the flow is a bit different. In JavaScript, since this is a human-made language with human-readable tokens, you have to parse it first. And then you have to compile that into byte code that you can execute. And then you can do some optimizations. But the great thing with WebAssembly at the bottom here is it's already byte code. You can just take it, decode it, compile it, and execute it. So it saves you one step. And if you wanted to, the optimizations could also be done in WebAssembly. So you only ship what you use. And you can make very, very, very small payloads with it. It's highly optimized. Um, what is not optimized, and that's on purpose, are the data types. Because it's very restrictive in what it allows you to do. This is all it has. This is the public interface. Now you get an i32, you get an i64, which are integer types, 32 and 64 bits. And then you get two float types. And that's it. Um, that's all of WebAssembly that is exposed right now. Uh, you might be wondering, I want to say hello world. Where are my strings? I want my strings back. Uh, you can express them as integers. I want an array. Express it as integers. We provide nothing else. Uh, also signedness. It's unsigned. Uh, only if the operation needs a signed integer then it can be interpreted as signed. But usually all of those are unsigned integers. Another thing that is simple in design is the memory uh, model. Uh, actually, it's kind of a stack machine. Uh, maybe that's more like the execution model, to be honest. So a stack works like that. You have a pointer to the top, and then you have a couple of cells. And you, the only thing you can do is pop some, uh, push something to the stack to put it on top. And then uh, you can also pop stuff from the uh, stack. Yeah, and that's more or less the entire thing that you can do. And this will be important in a second when we look at WebAssembly, how, how it looks like. But first off, our final question for the double-decker. Uh, who knows this guy? Please scream out the name as loud as you can. Where is it? You have to stand up, I cannot, I cannot do it, I cannot do it. Okay, so since you are the last one, and this was a very tough question, I'm not sure if anyone else would have been able to answer it. I got another pair of socks for you, which you were asking for before. 
So it's from NMI, which is a company that is uh, exposing here. So uh, please. <laughs> that was a horrible throw. John McCarthy. Car so he's a programmer slash genius professor. And he came up with Lisp. And Lisp had this very nice idea of code is data and data is code. So this is from Lisp theory and practice. And uh, it's an example of how a Lisp program looks like. So that's a listing. I'm not sure if you can see it, but mostly a lot of parentheses and a couple keywords, um, everything uppercase. But the main point is this is, can be interpreted as data and as code. So it's two representations of the same thing. And WebAssembly does exactly the same stuff. Um, all of those different parentheses, those blocks can be uh, can be uh, decoded separately and in parallel. So this is a WebAssembly module. Congratulations, if you open your editor, you put that into a file, you save it as a WAT file, and then you uh, transpile it to WebAssembly, you have a WASM done, uh, and it does exactly nothing. Uh, it's totally empty, but also uh, totally valid. Story of my life. Uh, and this is, uh, <laughs> This is uh, the, the entire thing that will be uh, created from it. Uh, you have the VASM binary magic string in the beginning, and then you have the VASM binary version. And uh, these are eight bytes. That's your smallest WebAssembly that you can create. But it's not really helpful. What you want is maybe some functionality. And the way it works is S expressions, Lisp, yes. It's a very functional way of thinking. So this is. Uh, which uh, comes with a func statement and then a signature and then locals and a body. And since this is very abstract, I would like to give you an example. Let's say you would like to give you an example. Let's say you want to write this in WebAssembly. This is a function to add two numbers. Uh, you would start with a function declaration inside of parentheses. You say func. And then you have two params and one result type. So param is specified by param. We have two i32s and we return a float 64. And uh, then we got a body, which is still undefined. So let's fill it out. What you have to do is inside of your body, you first have to get the variables from your parameters. It's, uh, remember the stack uh, that I showed you before? You have to pop stuff from the stack to get it into local scope. You say get the local uh, zero and uh, get the local one and the local two, which are those three parameters. And uh, actually, you can even specify some names here. Uh, WebAssembly doesn't care, but maybe you. It's more readable. And you put that into a module block. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So uh, for example, this would be a version to get the two variables. You name them A and B and then you call an add function on the two things that you pop from the stack, and the last thing that is on the stack will be returned to the caller. Uh, uh this won't work, because we haven't exported the function. We have to give it a name, and then you say export add, and then suddenly you can call it from the outside. And uh, if you save that, you have an add function, congratulations. Uh, this is nice for integers. It's a bit problematic for strings, though. Uh, this is hello world in WebAssembly. Um, basically, uh, we, we have a table of functions, and every function has to be defined explicitly. So uh, we say uh, we have a table zero of any function that means uh, it can have any type of input parameters and output parameters, and we have exactly one entry in our function table. And uh, this will be our hello world function that we, that we define as $func0. This is gonna be named hello, and this is callable from the outside. And you see memory one. Uh, this is one block of memory. So a block is 64K, and you can have as many blocks as you want, but the minimum is one block. And down here we have a data uh, section, similar to what other binaries are doing, which contains our hello world string. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it has to be uh, zero terminated, but uh, yeah. So that's the string that we want to return from our memory. 
So whenever we call hello, uh, we get the f a pointer to the first entry in our memory and we say, uh, it points to the age and then we say, okay, uh, here's, here's your cell that you're looking for. And then you can run that from JavaScript. Uh, that's a lot to take in. Um, but the main point is, there's a textual representation and there's a, so a binary format and those two are equivalent. So you can go uh, from one section to the other and you can inspect your code this way. Um, you get uh, this wet to wasm function, uh, which is a, a binary that you can use to do that kind of translation. Yeah, uh, so this was kind of a, a very, very quick tour around WebAssembly. And in reality, you don't want to write all of this yourself. Uh, it's nice if you've seen it once, but maybe you want to forget about it again. Uh, what you want instead is you want to use high-level languages. Okay, maybe a bad slide. It's not a high-level language uh, anymore, uh, but it's one of the things that target WebAssembly. And um, the way it works is um, we got a hello C file, which is just our normal uh, hello world that we have with printf. Then we have emcc, which is our C compiler for emscripten. And it can create some WebAssembly output. Yeah. And uh, yeah, here I open an empty file. <laughs> and uh, this is all of the glue code that they create for us, uh, which is a way to include WebAssembly. Uh, you don't have to write all of this, uh, luckily. Um, this is kind of a developer runtime and so on. But the most important point comes here. It's around 40 kilobytes in size. Uh, and I checked yesterday just to make sure that those are the up-to-date numbers. Uh, this is our WebAssembly file. And you can see the header up there, if only I was not. Yeah, actually, you can even uh, convert it to uh, text. I forgot I did that. Oh, yeah, this was the end. That's why uh, you cannot show it. but. You will see the text rep representation anyway. Um, yeah. So 40K, not much. How about another language? Go has a WebAssembly runtime. Uh, what are the odds? Uh, is it going to be bigger or smaller? Bigger, smaller, same size. Okay, so we have to think about what is Go and uh, how does it work. Um, let's just try first and then let's talk about it. So we got our main.go, super simple print line. And uh, wow, uh, okay. I, I removed the test. I show you main.go again in case you forgot about how it looks like. <laughs> you forgot about how it looks like. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not doing the demo. Yeah, this is also the final result. <laughs> yeah, this is GoOS uh, flags for, for building the WebAssembly. And, and uh, if I use the exact same output again, no? Let's, let's remove test WASM again. <laughs> what have I done here? What have I done here? <laughs> we will get to it. First, let me show main.go. <laughs> That's going to take a while. OK, there we go. So we finally got our uh, main.go, and I'm finally doing the LSALH, which, uh, yeah. And you see 2.2 megabytes. I highlighted it for you. It's really that, that big. Uh, so why? Well, Go comes with its own runtime, and it has an allocator and it has Go routines, and this does not come for free. So you have to pay for that. It ships the entire Go runtime with every single step. Now, there are plans to fix that. Uh, probably WebAssembly will get an allocator and also a runtime. But for now, 2.2 megabytes is kind of a deal breaker. So I told you I'm in the Rust community, and in reality, this is a talk from the Rust evangelism strike force. And that's why I want to show you how it works in Rust. So Rust is a systems language, so uh, you're different. So uh, you will have to get used to it a little bit. Uh, so here's how the Rust code looks like. You see 
Uh, we got use WASM bind chain, which is a bindings generator for WebAssembly. It has all the high level functionalities for you. And with this, we can use JS value as a result value. And you, we say there's uh, transformations between WebAssembly, uh, with, between JavaScript types and Rust types. And this is a JS value, for example. And we can use fancy things like console log one, where you say log one argument. So it's much more handy. And with that, I will skip that. Uh, there's a WASM pack build step, and uh, it's gonna compile all of the code that you need, and the result is gonna be super small. So we're talking about 1K of output, whereas we had two megabytes for Go. But it could go even further and use something called binary yen to make that even smaller, and you can apply that to every WASM file, and then the output is even better. Uh, that is the beginning, and if we apply our optimizer, well, it, nothing happened for Go, but uh, C is much smaller, and we are back to 400 bytes in Rust, which is almost as good as hand coding it, which is really impressive. Okay, so this was the technology part. Let's talk about examples for a moment. So first off, I added a search functionality to my blog, there. And it allows people to uh, search through my articles. It works with a Bloom filter. Actually, this is the article about it if you want to read it, it's on my blog. And you can integrate it into every static website. Um, and it's super tiny, like 50K. And this is my entire website and uh, it, it's running on WebAssembly. Uh, it does the normal search, only uh, full words though. Um, but yeah, um, works as expected. And as I said, for me, there's kind of a win to be able, for me, there's kind of a win to be able to do that. But more professional people have uh, built, for example, an image optimizer, uh, which works in WebAssembly. And it's super fast. Uh, maybe that's the only thing you can tell right now. But uh, it's, it's fully open source. You can download the code down there. Uh, other people are using it in, uh, Layer seven, layer eight proxies. Uh, Envoy, for example, is considering to add WebAssembly support, so you can add little WebAssembly snippets into your uh, services, microservices. And the main point about uh, WebAssembly mostly today is serverless. But what you do is you have all those machines from other providers like Cloudflare and Edge nodes and so on, but you don't use them uh, effectively um, what you can do is edge programming, which means you move your code as close to the client as possible, and you execute, for example, an API call right next to their device. So the latency is gonna be in the milliseconds, and this is amazing. Uh, you can uh, use, for example, Fastly's Terrarium for it, and this is a sample code uh, with TypeScript, uh, but you can also use Rust, thanks to WebAssembly, and what it allows you to do is uh, you can run code on their edge infrastructure with WebAssembly. Uh, Cloudflare recently announced a similar thing where they have workers uh, and you can run entire websites with it. They have 153 edge nodes, by the way. Uh, Chrome uh, recently added support for Google Earth. So this is a demo for Google Earth uh, running completely in WebAssembly. It kind of went unnoticed somehow, but I think it's, it's amazing. Uh, I don't know why it's lagging right now, but it, for sure it's fluent. Actually, uh, I'm scrolling into my area where I was born, so uh, su super interesting stuff. But it, yeah, it works with, with, with WebAssembly. I, you can tell I come from a very, very, it's getting, yeah, yeah, even, yeah, it's a small, it's a small, small village. Uh, anyone playing Diablo ever, though there's a shareware version that you can play, uh, I use a shareware recorder for that, sorry, but it's, it's great to know that you can ship full applications with it. Um, I won't show you the entire demo. I guess we, we won't have that much time anymore. Uh, but yeah, the entire thing works. Yeah, and you can just walk around and do stuff and kill people. Uh, there's also a WebAssembly package manager uh, where you can, it's similar like Docker, where you can uh, run applications that are transpiled to WebAssembly. 
Um, maybe that's going to um, take off. Who knows? And then there's a lot of standardization going on, uh, adding system interfaces, for example, reading files, writing files, access to network, and so on. This is all ongoing. It's a very nice blog post. You want to read that. The thing with, with Docker, for example, is also that the main Docker author, Solomon Hikes, he once said, if WASM and WASI existed in 2008, uh, 2008 we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. And uh, this is kind of a big, big statement coming right from him. So I think this is where uh, this is going, uh, a universal execution engine for your code. Yeah, they even added WASM support into Docker recently, uh, which you can also check out. So you can run WASM payloads. All, goes, uh, all of that goes to say that, yes, you should try it. And yes, there's uh, a lot of users already. And it should pick up uh, uh, steam pretty soon. But you might want to be on the forefront and give it a go in your applications and just see if it works for you. Uh, anyway. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Awesome. That was really cool. I suspect you're going to have lots of questions. So um, we just need to ask the questions on the mic. So if you want to ask a question, put your hand up and we'll bring the mic over to you. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, pointers. Uh, how, how does that work if you have those those data, only those small number of data types? Yeah, um, what I did not show was the JavaScript glue code. There is a little bit of runtime that has to be integrated into, I don't know, your browser or your desktop application. And this will do the transformation between, let's say, the data you request from WebAssembly and the data you retrieve from it. Uh, the way it works is, there are some APIs uh, in JavaScript where you can say, load this WebAssembly file. And you can say, give me, I'll call this function. And then your embedder, which is the WebAssembly runtime, it will do the address resolution inside of uh, WebAssembly and outside of it. OK. And my, my experience is that one, one of the problems with, uh, with uh, Apple Macintosh going over to 64-bit is that the programs that assume that pointers and integers are the same size are the ones that m mostly uh, break in. How, what's the relationship between pointers and integers in WebAssembly? Uh, yes, that's a known problem, and this, this is also why it's very well specified, like the pointer size. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, older architectures, 32 and 64-bit, the, the main problem was that people started using them without like having a standard for it, and then suddenly you run into all of those compatibility problems. Uh, whereas in WebAssembly, there, it has always been clear. I, I guess it's a, I, I think it's a 32-bit uh, pointer. I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, but the main point is it is specified and standardized. So if you want it, you could build a new version of WebAssembly, which actually is, is in the making, uh, and maybe increase the pointer size. And then your embedder would make sure that it's compatible with either version or so. Um, yeah, and, and uh, you could see from the WebAssembly magic header as well that there is a version number in it. So it's kind of a nice feature to have that from the get-go uh, rather than thinking about compatibility in the future because this for sure will be a problem yeah, and probably you know best. <laughs> Thanks for a really nice talk. Um, what's the developer experience like at the moment for, like, let's say, uh, the time it takes for you to save a file in Rust to seeing the changes in the browser? Is it kind of nice to work with at the moment, or could there be improvements? It could be nicer. So uh, specifically talking about Rust, the compile times are a problem. Um, especially sometimes it's unpredictable compile times. Um, for example, you want to add a functionality to uh, a WebAssembly module. You add a crate, which is something like a library in Rust, and then it can blow up your compile times to like 10 times of what it was before. Serialization, for example, is a classic, or I don't know, any data types that have a lot of dependencies. It's similar to Node.js right now. There's an explosion of packages. So this is a problem. When it comes to uh, quick iterations, usually 
in, in Rust specifically, there is cargo check where you can quickly just check the types so that they work and not compile the entire thing over and over again. One thing that I use personally for WebAssembly development and Rust is uh, SC cache, which is a cache for compilation targets on my machine. I'm not sure if I can show it right now. Probably not. I'll g uh, this is going to be uh, adventurous, so. Um, Oh, actually, oh yeah, I, I just, I literally just closed the terminal, yeah. Because I pulled it up and then I closed it again, why not? Oh yeah, that's nice. So, uh, SC, yeah. So, uh, this is the, the cache that I'm running on my machine right now. And you can see that it was trying to compile 59 uh, libraries and 40 of them were cached. That means my iteration cycle is much faster thanks to that. Um, when it comes to Go, uh, it's much faster, like we're talking about a second here, and similarly for uh, C, it's really fast. But Rust, it's still a problem, yeah. Hi, uh, um, I was just wondering about the, whether the WebAssembly running in a browser was able to access the other web APIs. So if you compare it, so JavaScript would be able to use them, can you use them from WebAssembly as well? Or is, and is there a lag between new APIs becoming available in browsers and I'm guessing it's something to do with that JavaScript glue? Yeah, uh, so not yet, that's the short answer. The long answer is but, but soon, actually it's not longer. Uh, so it's work, work, uh, worked upon. Um, uh, they were, they're working on it, so it has to be standardized. That's the main problem right now, uh, standardization, because whatever you add has to work also outside of the browser. It's not only for browsers. Everything that you add is meant to be working everywhere, even on a blockchain, for example, or on an edge node. Um, <coughs> you, that said, you can still add support for it right away by um, making the bindings yourself. Uh, in Rust, and I haven't shown that, there's a crate for it called JS value. And this way, uh, you can have a lot more different types. And there's, I think, also an API crate for it. But this is specific to the language then, not to WebAssembly itself. Now you could go and write your own bindings to those APIs and do the transformation from JavaScript to WebAssembly and back. It's kind of tedious, but people start building up the standard libraries uh, now. So it will be better in a year. Uh, if anything, I would advise everyone to start small with, with simple examples and then build up from there because it's already quite powerful um, and it's, it's getting more features as, as we go. But for now, I think the, the limited scope is kind of one of its big advantages. Cool, I think we should have one quick question at the end and then we'll finish up. Um, I'm presuming most computer games are written using DirectX and OpenGL APIs, and presumably when you port them over to run in a browser, um, how does, a sort of, do, does uh, the implementation of the sort of 3D graphics uh, library, does that have to be ported over as well, or is there a, uh, an imp a 3D implementation within the browser that you can use for free? Um, yes and no. Um, so. The way it works right now is that uh, you have to do uh, some kind of transformation between the internal memory of WebAssembly and what you show on a browser, for example, in a canvas or so. So usually the way uh, it works is you expose a canvas, you do the, all the computations and so on in the, in the background, and then you, you maybe sh uh, flush your memory back so that it gets represented on the browser. DirectX support is something that probably will not be added directly, but more like indirectly, where you say, okay, I want this to be executed on some kind of execution engine and don't really care how it works in the background, and it might use, for example, OpenGL or DirectX primitives in the background. Um, but honestly, I'm also not an expert on that, uh, the way it's integrated. Um, I, I'm just thinking that when it comes to those kind of uh, interactions and bindings, uh, right now the consortium is very conservative about adding too many dependencies because uh, if you look at DirectX, for example, those things, they age pretty badly 
again, because maybe they are not standardized or also because Falcon comes around and uh, you have to support two platforms. So they don't want to have too many guarantees. What, what is more closer is support for WebGL, for example. And I think this is also what uh, Google Earth is already using. Uh, honestly, I don't even know if they already use it from within WebAssembly. But you can always go and add your own libraries to your application and do the transformations yourself. And then use the APIs from JavaScript, so to say. Yeah, so it's all possible. And if you are concerned about performance, uh, that's a valid concern. But I would say uh, I was always surprised by the performance. So actually, it's only half as uh, fast as C, which is very, very fast. So like uh, two orders of magnitude faster than Python, for example. That's also what I saw in, in, uh, in my Rust experiments. So um, this, this will all get easier. And there will also be direct memory access at some point between um, JavaScript and WebAssembly. Uh, but that will be another talk, which is also interesting. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was a really great talk. <laughs>